I'm going to finish the series that I started uh, about a month ago on entitled Being a Disciple. And during that series, we've looked at a number of things. And these particular six elements that we've looked at or areas we've looked at were, are characteristics of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. We started off by looking at what it means to be a member of the body of Christ and a member of a local church. And uh, preached from Acts chapter 20 on the importance of the church. And then looked at what it means to be a magnifier or a worshiper from Psalms 86 that we are to worship God in every conceivable manner, including with our lives. We looked at the fact that disciples are maturing, that they are growing in spiritual maturity. Looked at ministry in the church, and that is that we are to be involved in the kingdom of God. We are to be involved in working in the kingdom. We looked at stewardship, or the fact that disciples are managers, by looking at the fact that God owns everything. And then last week we looked at talked about the power of the gospel, but specifically that disciples are messengers, that is, that disciples tell others about Jesus, and that the gospel changes people's lives, the gospel will transform people, but they cannot be transformed and they cannot be changed unless somebody tells them about Jesus. So today we're going to continue that, and you can just leave up the title slide for now. I'm going to read my text in just a moment. But people are looking for purpose in life. In fact, Google would tell us that some million plus times a month, that phrase or something related to that is, what is my purpose, is searched in uh, Google's search engine. So they would talk about it and want to explore what it means to have purpose and what it means to... Uh, be here and what it means to exist in this world why am i here is the question that they often ask for many people they go through life seeking fame or fortune or fun or power that everything that they do is about one of those elements they're they're working and they're maybe working multiple jobs or they're seeking a a better job so that they can make more money they're seeking after fortune, or they seek to do things that will bring them fame or notoriety so that people would know their name. And others, while they may not be as concerned about fame or fortune, they go through life trying to have as much fun as they can. That we're here for only a short time. Everybody knows that it is appointed unto man once to die because nobody's still living. Uh, the oldest person may be around 120 uh, is what you would find anywhere in modern history. And so everybody knows that death is inevitable, so have as much fun as you can while you are here. Others, however, would seek to achieve power and seek to be in control and seek to, to rule, whether it's through political means or whether it's through other aspects or avenues, but fame and fortune, fun, power, it is the purpose that most people have in their existence. And if we're not seeking those, we have a tendency in our culture to elevate those who help us have fun. If you are a football or basketball or baseball or soccer or hockey star, then we elevate you because you can play this game because we enjoy it. It is about our fun watching you play. Now, I'm a big sports fan. I love to watch them play, but... There's an, an element of we, we lift those people up and go, man, that's what I wish I could be like. They're, they're helping me to have fun, and in the process of them helping me to have fun, they're achieving fame, and they're uh, re achieving fortune. They're making a lot of money, and everybody knows their name. In fact, it was back probably late 80s, early 90s, the whole Be Like Mike idea that everybody wanted to be like Michael Jordan great basketball player a lot of fame a lot of fortune be like Mike 
We strive to be like those who have fame and we reverence or emulate those who have power. We're seeking after purpose in one of those areas. But the writer of Ecclesiastes who calls himself the preacher, he said this, that everything is meaningless. That when you look at fortune or you look at fame, he said the money that you achieve is going to pass away, you're going to die, somebody else is going to have your money. Whatever fame or notoriety that you have, it's going to wane and then you're going to pass off the scene. And he says it's it's all just meaningless. The reality is that anything other than doing the will of God is meaningless. That if we go through life seeking fortune or fame or fun or power, all of that ultimately is meaningless unless we are following the will of God. Everything will fade away. You're here today because you believe the Bible. You're here today because you believe what the Bible says. And because of that, you know that this earth will fade away. That only that which is built upon the kingdom of God will last forever. Everything else will fade away. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of God endures forever. It is only God and His kingdom that will last forever. So any pursuit of fame or fortune or fun or power, all of that ultimately is meaningless and it will pass away. But God has given us a purpose. We are not here to call ourselves Christians and then to follow the pursuits of the world. We're not here to be saying, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I'm seeking fortune, fame, and power, and all the fun I can have, we're here to say we are followers of Jesus, and because of that, that means we live different, we walk different, we talk different, that our purpose is different. Just to make sure that you're listening, tap your neighbor and say, God has given you a purpose. That purpose is this, that He has commissioned us and commanded us to make disciples that is why you and i are still here is because we have a purpose of bringing other people into the kingdom of god and making sure that they become followers of jesus It doesn't really matter if I have a lot of money. It doesn't matter if people know my name. It doesn't matter how much fun I have or what kind of power I achieve. My purpose is about making disciples. And I would tell you that your purpose is about making disciples. That your mission is about making disciples. The question is this, is not whether it is your mission, but the what. The the real question is whether or not we are going to fulfill that mission and fulfill that purpose. Back in the 60s, I believe, is when the show began, Mission Impossible starts off the episodes, and then later they made movies about it, but it would start off where you'd get this recording. On that recording, it would lay out the mission that this, whatever the particular agent was, the mission that they are supposed to pick up and to take, and it would end with this. This is your mission if you choose to accept it. God has given us a purpose. The question is not whether we have purpose. The question, though, is whether we will walk in that purpose and whether we will fulfill that purpose. And I would tell you that in much of my life, I haven't fulfilled that purpose. I've been involved in full-time ministry since 1998. And doing various types of ministry and being, being paid to do ministry. But much of that, while I was doing that, served as a substitute for the mission, which is to make disciples. And to be honest with you, it really wasn't until we came here to start Cross Church that I began to 
get busy and get serious about the mission of making disciples. Sure, I was teaching people how to do ministry in, in previous roles that I had, and I was helping to mature them as Christians. But ultimately, all of that, while that is part of the process, but what God is calling us to do is to make disciples, which is not only to mature them, but also to get them to become followers of Jesus. And then when they become followers of Jesus, then they have to be, continue to become better and more mature followers of Jesus. And so maybe in some ways I was involved in that, but not from the start to finish aspect of sharing the gospel with people and seeing them born again and then seeing them take baby steps toward becoming a, a more mature follower of Jesus. The question you may ask is, what is a disciple? If we're supposed to make disciples, what is that? A disciple is a fully trained follower of of Jesus. Luke 6:40 would say this, a pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone after he has been fully trained will be like his teacher. That we are to be followers of Jesus and we're to be fully trained followers of Jesus, which means that we're to be growing and we're to be becoming more and more like him. So what is a fully trained disciple? That is a person who is fully devoted that their life revolves around Jesus Christ and His kingdom, they are to be developing. That means they are to be growing and maturing and becoming more and more like Jesus. And they are to be deployed. That means that they are to be about the mission of Jesus. They are to be messengers, like we talked about last week, sharing the gospel, but also they are to be making disciples. Not just telling people about Jesus, but, but seeing to it that they come into a relationship with Him and then they mature through that process. We are called to be fully trained disciples and to make fully trained disciples. Paul would write to the church at Corinth that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. And He has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That His purpose was to make disciples and our purpose is to make disciples. So how do we do that? What does it look like? Is it possible to do it wrong? How can we make sure that we do it right? Interestingly, there is at the end of Jesus' time here on earth, He gives a commission. We call it the Great Commission. It is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke where Jesus commissions his disciples to go out to make disciples. It is a commission, and I've preached about this before, it's a commission because he who has all power, as Matthew would say, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. And then Jesus, after saying that, says, now I send you. Now I'm telling you what to do. I have the power, I have the authority now, I'm giving that to you to go and make disciples. But it's also not just a commission, it is a commandment that we do this. He gives us the power to do it, but He gives us the command to do it as well. So Luke tells us some of Jesus' last words. It is after the resurrection. Luke 24 is where I'll be reading today. Luke 24, 44, Then He said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must, must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So in the next few moments, I want to talk to you about this, that we are commissioned to multiply. We are commissioned to multiply. In our text, which is called the Great Commission, this is Luke's version as I referenced 
there are some principles of making disciples that I want to bring to your attention. There are some truths about this. But ultimately understand this, that God has commissioned us to participate in His mission to make disciples, and therefore we must do it according to His plan and His process. The first truth about making disciples in this text is this, is that disciple-making is rooted in the Scripture. It is rooted in the Scripture. Verse 44 and 45 tell us this. Once again, He said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And He opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Now keep in mind that these Disciples had been with Jesus for some three plus years. They had been walking with Jesus. They had been living with Jesus. They weren't showing up on a Saturday then at the synagogue once a week and talking to Jesus or listening to Him lecture. These 11 men... Remember, Judas is no longer with them. But these 11 men have been living with Jesus, walking. They left the fishermen, they left their nets, and the tax collector, he left his tax booth. And they are walking with Jesus every day for three years. Wherever Jesus would go, they would go. Now, every day is doesn't mean every single day. There were times when He would send them out and there were times when they were apart. But for the most part, on a daily basis, they are spending time with Jesus. They are watching Jesus heal. They're watching Jesus cast out demons. They're listening to Him teach. They're observing what He's doing. And they are now supposed to emulate what Jesus has done. And after three plus years of that, they still didn't get it. So Jesus brings to their remembrance the Scriptures and He goes through the Law and the Prophets and He says, this is what was already written about what I was going to do and what I was going to be and what was going to happen. He reminded them of the prophecies about His death, burial, and resurrection. Then the Bible says He opened their understanding that after three plus years, they still didn't quite get it. That's important because if we're not careful, we can look at them and go, man, those are some dumb people. Three years with Jesus and they still didn't get it. And we can make the assumption that we can show up once a week and go, I can get everything there is to know. John and I were talking before church today. The national average is now closer to one and a half times a month that people show up to church. That's 18 times a year across all denominations that people come to church. And you wonder why they call themselves Christians, but they don't look like it, they don't act like it, they don't talk like it. You can't become a disciple of Jesus Christ and come into church 18 times a year. It doesn't happen. They spent three years with Him almost every day and they still had to have Him do something supernatural and open their understanding and say, let me tell you all this again. But disciple making must be rooted in the Scripture. It's where we go to find out how Jesus wants us to live. It's where we go to find out what He wants us to do. It's where we go to find out what He thinks about certain things. It's where we go to get a biblical worldview. We've got to make disciple-making about the Scripture. It's not about just follow me and, and watch what I do. But no, it's about getting into the Scripture. Studies by various religious organizations all seem to come to the same conclusion that Bible intake is the number one driver for spiritual growth and maturity. That getting into the Bible 
on a daily basis is the number one driver of helping you grow and become a disciple of Jesus. I've talked about this in more recent days, but a biblical worldview, less than 6% of the population has a biblical worldview. And what that means is that they have an accurate view of nine particular questions that are asked on the survey. The majority of Christians and non-Christians alike believe that the Bible just contains the Word of God, but it's not the Word of God. And I've talked about this, and what that means is you can take your Bible and go, man, I don't like that. That love your neighbor stuff, I don't like that. He didn't really, that's not really God's word. Somebody just made that up. And that love your enemy stuff, who would come up with that? That can't be the word of God. And they take the Bible and they just pick and choose what they like and what they don't like. And it doesn't matter whether they go to church or not, it's almost the same percentage which is well over 50% of our culture here in the United States, says it contains the Word of God, but it's not really the Word of God, so I get to choose. But I would tell you, you can't have a biblical worldview, and you can't be the disciple that He's called you to be, or He's called us to make, unless you are going to the Scripture. It's not about some curriculum, it's about getting into His Word. It's not about reading some book, it's about getting into the Word of God. And making disciples requires that People learn, know, and live the Bible. Jesus and James would both say, we must be doers of the word and not hearers only. He who just is a hearer of the word, like the foolish man who built his house on the sand, and when the winds came and the waves came, it washed it all away. But when you live the word of God, when you are a doer, it is like the man who built his house on the rock. And when the winds come and the waves come, his house stands because it's founded on the word of God. Disciple making must be rooted in the scripture. Secondly, disciple making is founded on the gospel. The gospel in it is in its essence is the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. In our text, Jesus would say to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. That is the gospel. That is the good news that Jesus Christ died in our place. He was buried, but He rose again. We're not serving a God who is still in a, in a tomb, but we serve a God The God of an empty tomb. His tomb is empty because He rose again just like He said. And that means that you and I can have life. If He is alive, then we can have life. The Old Testament would foreshadow this. And that's why Jesus would say it is written. And they didn't fully understand it. But the Old Testament would refer to the suffering Messiah. That the Messiah would be beaten and He would be ultimately be crucified. That He would be raised from the dead and so jesus lived the life we couldn't live and died the death that we should have died and he made a way for our salvation so disciple making must be founded on the gospel of jesus christ and and i say that in a there's a number of senses and, and ways in which that is true but in matthew's gospel and his his version of the great commission he says go into all the world or go and make disciples, baptizing them, and then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And ultimately what he's saying is this, you have to share the gospel so that they will become converts. And then they can mature and start living a certain way. You can't just show up and go, you know, I just want to live a better life. That's not a disciple. A disciple is someone who has partaken of the gospel, and now they are following Jesus, and now they are living a better life. You can't just go straight to the better life piece, and I just want to do certain things. But you've got to go back to the gospel. 
and understand that you could not save yourself. There is only one hope of salvation, and that is Jesus Christ. Thirdly, disciple-making requires the new birth. Jesus told them that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations. When Nicodemus came to Jesus, Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling 70 elders in Israel, and he comes to Jesus at night so that his friends and his fellow Sanhedrin members don't know that he's talked to them. He comes and you've heard me talk about this. You've probably read it for yourself. And he says to Jesus, Rabbi, which means teacher, we know that you come from God. Otherwise, you couldn't do all this stuff you're doing. And Jesus cut to the chase. Now, it's possible that Jesus said more than what we have written here. But what we have written by John is what Jesus wanted us to have. And he just cuts to the chase. He says, if you want to go to heaven, you've got to be born again. He doesn't get into a lengthy dialogue. He just says, if you want to go to heaven, you've got to be born again. Nicodemus, probably confused by both the words and the sequence, when he just makes a statement and Jesus responds with, if you want to go to heaven, you've got to be born again. Not, yep, yeah, I'm from God, not... Yeah, what makes you think this, and how long have you been following me? What have you heard about me? But he just cuts to the chase, and he throws out the new birth, and Nicodemus says, how can a man enter or be born again? Can he enter a second time his, into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus says, marvel not that I said to you, you must be born again. You must be born of water and spirit to enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus cuts to the chase and said, it's all about the new birth. Once again, you can't just say, I, I want to follow you and I want to skip this other part. I want to follow you, but I want to skip this gospel piece. I want to follow you and I want to skip this conversion piece. The disciple making must begin with the scripture and it must point to the gospel and it must point to the application of the gospel, which is to be born again. We have a former president who I would say pretended, maybe, maybe most of them, <laughs> pretended to be a Christian. And regardless of what you think of his policies and practice and his personality, the point that I want to make is this, when asked about repentance, made this statement, I never repented. I've never had anything to repent of. Would he claim to be a Christian? Yes. Would he act like he's a Christian? Yes. I could point out a whole lot of things he needed to repent of. <laughs> But that's not even the point. The point is that the Bible would point out a whole lot of things he needed to repent of. But you can call yourself a Christian, but if you don't go through the new birth process, it's just a title. It's just a category. It's just a classification. It's just what you say on a survey. But Jesus said, you must be born again. Disciple-making must be, fourthly, personally experienced. No one can be born again for you. No one can repent for you. No one can be baptized for you. Oh, there are people who try that. There are religious belief systems that they will baptize for the dead and they'll baptize for other people. But getting back to the first truth of it's got to be rooted in the Scripture, you can't find that in the Scripture, and so it doesn't really count. 
your parents or your grandparents or your siblings or your kids or your grandkids, they can't have faith for you. It has to be personally experienced. It's the Sunday after Thanksgiving, so I'll bring in food. I can't have a sermon without food, or at least talking about food. And but it, now I, I mean, I've, I've done this all my life. This is the way I was raised. Now I believe it's what everybody should do. Everybody should pray before they eat. I won't see it. I won't ask for a show of hands, but that's just. It is a biblical process of giving thanks before what we're getting ready to eat. And there are times when we're with a group or we're with family, and not everybody is at the table. You ever been in a situation like that? And if I'm sitting at the table and people are dilly-dallying, taking their time getting to the table, I'm ready to eat. One of my character flaws is I'm impatient. Another one is that I like to eat too much. And so I'm, I'm sitting there at the table waiting on people to hurry up and get their stuff together so we can eat. And sometimes, we'll pray before everybody gets there. Anybody done that? You're like, I'm eating, and you just pray for your food. They'll walk to the table. We've prayed, we've given thanks, and we're like, yeah, we've already prayed, let's go ahead and eat. But what I started saying to people is this. I can't be thankful for your food. Only you can be thankful for your food. Lord, thank you for my food and their food. That doesn't help them at all. I can say those words, but unless they're expressing thanks, my thanks for their food doesn't do any good. And while it's not a sin, you're not going to hell if you don't thank God for your food and pray before you eat. The point is this, is that I can't be born again for you. And you can't be born again for somebody else. It has to be personally experienced. It has to be something that you do. And Jesus would say this in verse 48. He said, you are witnesses of these things. He's not just going, well, somebody else heard about this and somebody else knows about this. But he said, you saw this, you heard this, you know that I was crucified and you know that i was buried and you see me now you are personal personally witness these things and so what i would tell you is this that if i have to be fully devoted you can't be devoted for me i have to be fully mature or developing you can't do it for me i have to be living on mission you can't live it for me Discipleship is not an, ex, an academic exercise where we just say, well, here's the information that you need to know, but it's not just facts and figures, but it is about a relationship with Jesus Christ, and you have to have that relationship for yourself. That my relationship with Jesus, it may impact your life, and it may help you out, and you may be able to do something I do and to watch what I do, but you have to have your own relationship with Jesus. It must be personally experienced. And lastly, disciple making must be empowered by the Spirit. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. The Gospel of Luke would end with Jesus saying, the promise is coming, the power is coming. And the book of Acts would begin with Jesus once again reiterating that you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me. The disciple making devoid of the Spirit is just talking. It is the Spirit that brings the power change it is the spirit that brings the power to witness it is the spirit that brings the power to overcome
The Spirit that leads us into a relationship with Jesus that causes us to break from our old life and to begin a new life in Christ. It is the Spirit that helps us do that. It is the Spirit that helps us to live out the Christian life. If you look at the Christian life from the outside and go, man, that's a lot of stuff that they're doing or not doing. and They've got rules and regulations and and in some ways, the rules and regulations, that if, if you could call them that, are the expectations of a Christian. Some of those are pretty simple. You either do it or you don't do it. It's, there's nobody here that walked out of their house this morning unclothed. You put on clothes. I can assure, I, I, I am 100% confident you didn't stand at the front door and go, man, am I going to put on clothes today or not before I go out there? You just did it. And so there are certain things about living the Christian life, it's just, you just do it. But then there are other things about our motives and our attitudes and the thoughts and intents of our heart that that's a little harder to change it's a little harder to to overcome but we can do that through the power of the spirit that when you look at somebody and say man they're an awesome christian they didn't get there by just doing the easy things they didn't get there by doing the things that anybody could just decide to do but they did that because they're in the Word of God and because they are empowered by the Spirit of God. And it helps them to live an overcoming life. It helps them to live in the way in which God has called them to live. And unfortunately, there are way too many people who call themselves followers of Jesus. Or maybe they don't even say followers. The, it's the more ubiquitous I'm a Christian that can mean almost anything that they try to live for Jesus or say they're living for Jesus but they don't have the power of the spirit and therefore they can't live the life that he has called them to live disciple making is rooted in the scripture it is founded on the gospel it requires the new birth and it must be personally experienced. And it must be empowered by the Spirit. As Anthony comes to the music, there is a truth that I say frequently. It's that you cannot give what you do not have. If I'm not a disciple, I can't make somebody a disciple. If I'm not a follower of Jesus, I can't help somebody become a follower of Jesus. If I'm not a child of God, I can't help somebody become a child of God. So the first step in the process of becoming disciple of Jesus is that process of being born again of repenting of our past repenting of our sins and the things that we have done that is not what God would have us to do whether it's trying to save ourselves or just living and doing things that are displeasing to him any and all of the above, and we say, Lord, I'm, I'm done with that, and I want to follow you. The process of repenting. And then, we say, Lord, I want to have my sins washed away in the waters of baptism, and I want to take on your name, which is why we have a baptistry sitting here to my right. It's not just something we do because other churches do it. 
No, but it's something we do because the Bible says we must be born of water and spirit. And so we baptize people and have their sins washed away in the name of Jesus. We take on his name and Paul would say we are buried with him in baptism. It is an identification with the burial of Jesus. Just as repentance is an identification with the death of Jesus where we die to ourselves and we're buried with him in baptism. Then we receive the infilling of the Spirit, evidence and speaking in a language we've never spoken, which, which is the sign that the Spirit of God has moved in and will enable us to be empowered by the Spirit. So to make a disciple, you have to be a disciple. To help somebody become born again, you really need to be born again. So coming back to where we started with purpose, God has given us a purpose, which is to be and to make disciples. It is the process of multiplication. But even if we take it back a step and go, it's not, it doesn't have to be multiplication, maybe it's just duplication. Where I take what I am and what God has done in me and then I help somebody else to, to live that and to achieve that. That's duplication. The multiplication piece is I help them to become a disciple like me and now they are helping somebody to become a disciple like me and them and it multiplies but before we can multiply we actually have to just duplicate we have to help somebody become a follower of Jesus somebody said when somebody was a person was talking about they were going to plan all kind of a, a, a great number of churches and they say well before you can plant two you got to plant one so before I can make a multitude of disciples just have to make one when I was campus pastor slash dean of students at Gateway College of Evangelism in St. Louis I had a multitude of tasks that I did a multitude of areas that I oversaw one of the things that I did on a regular basis was I would make keys. Every dorm room had a lock and people were notorious for losing their keys and we had master keys but they'd lose their key and we'd have to make new ones at the beginning of the year or if they would lose them we would make new ones and I was Part of my responsibility, I oversaw all the maintenance and all the dorms and a variety of things. And I had people to make keys, but sometimes it was just easier for me to go down to the basement, get the key machine, and make the key. If you've ever seen it in process now, you, you very seldom can actually see what they're doing. The stuff is done inside of a, a case. You don't really see the cutting of the, the key and how it works. And we had an old key machine. You would take the key let me find my keys here. This is the church key. I know it's the church key because it's shaped a certain way. There are some similarities to these other keys but this one is unique on my it's actually my wife's key ring you would take the original key put it in the machine get it lined up just correct tighten it down you would take a blank key of the same kind put it in the machine the right way and then you would tighten it down and there was a guide that would follow the ups and downs of the key and you would have to make sure that you you were following 
had the guide pushed all the way in the right spot and as you moved it from left to right it would follow the ridges and while that was going on there was a cutting wheel that was going back and forth with the key and it would be cutting the grooves and the notches sometimes weren't real careful it could slip a little bit and you take that key off and you're in the basement you could be a long way away from the door you take that you look at that you line it up and go yeah that looks right then you go try it in the door and it doesn't work because you weren't being real diligent and you it looked pretty close but it wasn't exact So if one part of the key was messed up, the key wouldn't work. What I've come to tell you today is this. He has called us to be disciples. To be fully trained, to be fully devoted, to be fully developing, and to be fully deployed. We'll never be perfect this side of heaven, but perfection should be our goal. And it's not just here a little, there a little, and we'll just do whatever. But it's about getting in the Scripture and following Jesus. It's about being the person He wants us to be. And when we are that person, we help others. But my admonition to you is this. We don't have to be perfect to start helping somebody else go further down the journey, or further down the line. We can become better disciples by helping make disciples. Researchers would say that we retain 10% of what we read. That you can read a book today and in a short period of time you might remember 10% of that. We retain 20% of what we hear. We retain 30% of what we see. If you put seeing and hearing together, we get 50%. We retain 70% of what we talk about with others. We retain up to 80% of what we experience personally. but we retain some 95% of what we teach to others. We can become better disciples by making disciples. Not that we are perfect. As Paul would say, not that I've achieved this or already attained everything I need to, but he said, forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forth to those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm not perfect now, but I've come a little ways. And to the extent that I've moved in my journey and I've, I've gone down the road a little bit, I can tell somebody else, hey, this is how you should go. This is the way that you should walk and if I'm not praying ever, as, as much as I should, but I'm praying some, I can say, hey, I'm praying a little bit. Let me help you learn how to pray. And I'm reading my Bible. Let me help you read your Bible. And I'm telling others about Jesus. Let me help you. And as we teach others and as we work with others, we will become better disciples. We just stand together. We are commissioned and commanded to make disciples.
And I don't know if you feel what I feel. But this is the heartbeat of God. Some 50 to 65% or so of our congregation is not here today for various reasons. Sickness, travel. But even if they were all here, that is not the extent of what God would have in this city to be fully developed, deployed, and devoted followers of Jesus. It is His will and His desire that His kingdom would expand. And it happens when we multiply and make disciples. So my call to action for you today is this. Seek to grow as a disciple. Don't be satisfied with where you are. I've been doing this a long time. I've got a long way to go. It's easy to coast and it's easy just to go, it's good enough. But don't settle for where you are, but seek to grow as a disciple. And secondly, identify someone that you can begin to disciple. You don't have to be an expert. You just have to be a follower of Jesus. You don't have to have it all worked out. You just have to love Jesus and want somebody else to love Him too. Would you lift your hands right now? Would you close your eyes? and Would you lift your hands? And would you just talk to the Lord for a moment? Jesus, we love You. Jesus, we love You. 